Okay, great. Thank you, everyone. I think I'll take over from here then. Um, the question about the operating budget 10-year forecast chart uh, is not a new question. Everyone has wrestled with it from its inception about eight years ago. And uh, it is not very easy to describe, but I'll try my best tonight. I've come up with a table that I'm gonna share on my screen um, that hopefully will help illustrate what we mean by behind the cumulative gap and what the situation is if, let me hide that real quick, um, the city were to just simply resolve the gap between revenues and expenditures each year with one-time resources. So in the 10-year forecast, we have baseline revenues and we have baseline expenditures and the gaps start to show up at 2024. I should have put a header up here that shows the years. Let me do that just for the sake. of knowing what year is happening. So the way that the math following it through, each surplus or gap is calculated when you take revenues and you subtract expenditures. And so in these years, because expenditures exceed revenues, that's where we're ending up with a shortfall. The first shortfall that appears is in 2024 when there's about $107,000 shortfall. If we do nothing to increase ongoing revenues, if we do nothing to reduce ongoing expenditures, then that gap still exists in 2025. Growth in expenditures also adds to the problem another $1.1 million worth of costs. So essentially, revenues and expenditures out of these expenditures are still the services over here that generated that gap, so that gap still exists. The full gap between the revenues and expenditures is $1.2 million. That's the, the full gap. So another way of looking at it, by not resolving the gaps that appear in each year, you're paying for the gap that appeared in the first year seven times, you're paying for the additional growth six times over, you're paying for those costs five times over. That's where the cumulative of the cumulative throughout the forecast of the, uh, the operating budget here means that by the end of the day, if we do nothing to increase revenues or reduce expenditures, we will have used one-time savings out of our savings account to pay for those costs to the tune of $25.9 million over that time frame. Conversely, if the city were to take action and pretty much a lot of the revenue streams that the city can implement, it has implemented. A lot of the financial sustainability strategies that we identified in the 10 year plan continue to be implemented to this day so really, the only actions that we could take would be to reduce expenditures. And if we were to do that, if we were to reduce the baseline expenditures each year to match our ongoing revenues that we have that are sufficient to support ongoing costs, we would end up reducing expenditures in 2024. We'd zero that out. There'd be no more gap. We would have resolved that issue. Then if we reduced expenditures even further in 2025, we'll have it resolved that gap. So in other words, we'd implement ongoing solutions to bring our expenditures down to meet the revenues that we have to pay for those expenditures. Or on the flip side, we could increase revenues in order to be able to not have to cut expenditures, not have to cut programs. Does that help to explain the math? Rick, this is John, and it does not uh, help me that much because suppose in 2000 and uh, what's the first year? 2024? 2024. Yeah. 
Suppose that the city, by the end of that year, someone gave the city $107,000. That gap would disappear, correct? They would have to give us $107,000 each year for every year because those are ongoing expenditures. They couldn't just give us $107,000 one time because we'd have to pay for that same $107,000 of expenditures next year and the year after that and the year after that. But that's not what your model shows. Your model shows that, say, for 2025, there was a, a difference between the income and rev, uh, revenues and expenses of 1.139. It's the difference between 53.3 million in revenues and $54.5 million is 1.246 million. That 1.2 million dollars is comprised of the first gap that appeared in 2024 and additional growth of 1.1 million. There's the 1.246 million dollars. That's how the gap continues to grow as expenditures continue to grow into the future. And revenue doesn't as long as revenue doesn't keep up with that growth and the growth in expenditures is exceeding the growth rate of revenues the gap just continues to grow in the future years rick this is lincoln if i can make a suggestion i think it's your wording down in line 13 that gets confusing cumulative gap in, in your thinking is just the additive right you had 107 and so that year's gap in that year explicitly between line three and four is 1.246. But in reality, if you borrowed each year to come up with this, in year 2025, you would have 107,000 plus 1,246 is the cumulative amount of savings you have burned through to keep to avoid having to raise taxes. So I think there just a little bit of change in wording or, or how you describe these on the lines might make it easier to understand because normally people think- I see. Maybe use the word deficit. Yeah, and it is a deficit, right? It is a, a deficit between ex, you know, expense and revenues for that year. But ultimately what you're saying is somewhere along the line, if over that same period of time, I'm trying to look here quickly, but it's about, yeah, 25 million, if you will, that you would have burned through in savings that you don't have. That's correct. That makes sense. Instead of cumulative gap, calling it the shortfall. Something like that. Anyhow, again, the difference between the annual, which each of these numbers right now, as I look at them, are the annual gap that year. And then the additive is really the 25 million in, in column I. I see. That makes sense. Um, there was a question in the chat of what was the operating reserve as of today? Uh, the I'm not entirely certain. Sarah, do you have that number? That, that question came from Joseph Smith, and then I have a follow-up question. In terms of the expenditures, um, uh, how is that factored? Is that growing at a CPI? Um, you know, how is that growing from year to year from, you know, 2024 to projected 2028? I mean, I can, I can do the math, but I mean, um, how is that calculated? How is that, you know, kind of best guess? <clears throat> In the, the background of our 10-year model, we look at, we actually chunk the different types of expenditures that we have, and we model their behaviors independently of each other. We have certain cost factors that influence salaries and benefits, but they are not the same cost factors that normally, um, or that may influence other costs in other areas of the city. So we know that by a matter of policy, our city council ties cost of living adjustments for salaries to the year over year change of the CPIU. And they use the same June to June percentage change of CPIU that was used for the levy lid lift in the past. We know that our medical premiums historically the, for the medical benefits that we provide staff have grown to the tune of about six to six and a half percent per year. And so that growth in that particular kind of expense for the city is factored to continue that same trend into the future. 
We look, have looked historically at how our police services contract has grown in costs over the years. And a lot of those costs are outside of our control. The, the biggest part for the dedicated personnel from King County Sheriff's Office is salaries and benefits of the officers, chief, captains. And those are under the control of King County and the negotiations that happen with the Police Officers Guild. There was a period in time where they were given some hefty colas, but still looking back at the historical trend of the police services contract, even though we've been at approximately 51, 52 officers for the longest period of time, the contract has typically grown about 5% each year, which is more than uh, COLA has been for much of our staff. So we, we model our police services cost separately from how we model salaries and benefits and other things. Most of our other operating type expenditures, um, we break out our professional services contracts. Most of those have inflators in the contracts that are tied to CPI as well. And then there are things like office supplies that we don't just grow that budget. So those are held flat in our operating budget forecast model. All that to say that it's not just one single inflator that we just say the budget, the city's budget is going to grow five or 6% every year. We actually try to, to forecast out based on how expenditures have, of different types have, have behaved in the past. Okay. No, I appreciate you walking me through that. My final question would be, does this um, take into account additional headcount of city employees. I mean, we just heard a presentation that the city's looking to grow pretty rapidly from a, you know, um, residential standpoint, as well as potentially um, people working in the city. Are, is this cost a headcount of people needed to help the city function? The only, uh, well, the operating budget looks at just the city's general fund and the street fund. So it doesn't take into account the wastewater utility, our capital programming, any of that kind of stuff. The operating budget forecast assumes status quo for staff across the board that provide the services that you're hearing about in these presentations. With the exception, and I put it in the chat, the city wanted to forecast what the cost impact would be and build that into the forecast of maintaining roughly one officer per thousand population. And so that's adding about 15 to $20,000 of cost each year just to keep up with the one officer per thousand population ratio as the population is forecast to grow in the model. But other than that, it does not have built into it anywhere in the future, the addition of staff that is otherwise addressing other service needs. These really are the forecast growth of existing costs that we're, it's, that we're incurring and budgeting for today. They're growing into the future. Rick, can you pull back up the, the, the chart for us? I have a couple questions. Do you want the chart or do you want the, the table? The, the, the table. First question. What is the scenario? So this scenario here would be if the city were to reduce expenditures, how the shortfall would behave in the future. Okay, why do you balance the budget for three years and then in 2027 you start going backwards? This is just to illustrate that if the city, uh, let's say we ended up in 2026 and the city had taken measures to reduce expenditures in 2024, 2025, and 2026, how much would they then need to cut in order to balance in 2027? Okay, and does the city have a policy, a guideline, or other word to have a balanced budget each year? The city does. We have in our budget book in the appendix, appendix section, we have our financial policies that are adopted by the council each year as they adopt the budget book. And it says that the city shall have um, shall not have an ongoing shortfall in its budget or an ongoing budget deficit. That ongoing revenues shall be 
sufficient to support ongoing expenditures. What you'll see in our budget, in many cases, we will show that revenues might be less than expenditures, but in the budget as a total, the expenditures might include some one-time monies. And that's when we talk about the use of fund balance that are used to then pay for those one-time costs. In our budget, we, um, we pay for ongoing costs with ongoing revenue streams like property tax, sales tax, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. And we use one-time savings to pay for one-time costs. In this top part of the chart here, we would have to diverge from that financial policy and we would have to use one-time savings to pay for ongoing costs each year if we did nothing to reduce expenditures or increase revenues. Okay. I will also point out, Jim, that um, the state does not allow us to not have a budget balanced budget. So we tend to um, not like to use the word deficit because people tend to associate that with the federal government, which does allow deficits. Right. And um, we, when we pass a budget, it needs to be balanced either with those ongoing resources or with our own fund balance. So- mm -hmm. um, Okay. Okay. So that's how the, the city's 17.1 operating budget could be reduced if it didn't match up you could say okay we've got x amount of dollars to cover it for this one particular year do i understand you correctly yes, correct okay Thanks. so you can choose but as rick said by policy we do that very selectively so if we believe that there is an ongoing problem we need to solve it with an ongoing solution <laughs> so in the case of the pandemic Council said this isn't an ongoing problem. It's it it's a crisis, and if we need to use, we anticipated we might need to use reserves, so we budgeted to use reserves as a result of the pandemic, and we also had backup measures in place too in case we hadn't identified enough reserves to use. Then we we had some reductions we could have we thought we would make if we needed to, but. The by policy had it had the forecast been this is going to go on for four years. I then our policy really would require us to make longer term so you know a longer term solution. So it would be either finding new revenue or reducing reducing costs. Does the city have an operating reserves policy, meaning we need five million dollars, ten million dollars, whatever? as kind of the zero or what is that process like? The city, as part of the financial policies as well, there's a couple of different components there. We have a requirement that we will at a minimum maintain $3 million in reserves mm -hmm. to that. We also maintain 2% okay. of our operating revenues each year. Those are really for cash flow so that we can make sure we can pay our bills. That's that's roughly about 60 to 90 days worth of cash to be able to pay bills. Let's say for some reason, some natural disaster hit and uh, maybe not even a natural disaster, but just something to hit to where we couldn't access um, <clears throat> deposits from the state or something like that. We'd have enough cash in the bank to be able to cut checks to pay bills. And then the yep. city also has a revenue stabilization fund that we recalculate each year. And that sets aside 30% of our economically sensitive revenue, property tax, sales tax. We consider those to be economically sensitive. And that's the revenue stabilization fund that Sarah was speaking about, the reserves that Sarah was speaking about. Essentially, that would be a short-term stopgap measure that should be there be a short-term recession that would result in us collecting less revenue in a year or two to allow us some time to not have to make drastic cuts immediately, but give us some time to figure out, okay, what are the impacts of the recession? Where is it really truly hitting services? And then make targeted cuts instead of just across the board, like what a lot of cities had to do back in the great recession. So Rick, Linda's had a hand up and then I see Robin has a hand up. 
Uh, thank you. And I want to thank all of you for this extended time with us. Um, I've really learned a lot. Um, just for clarification, uh, regarding Rick's tables that we just saw a few moments ago, when we talk about increasing revenues or reducing expenditures, if I look at the, the set of slides that we got entitled budget highlights back on the 10th, slide number six, general operating revenues, those are, those are the revenue streams that we're talking about, increasing those, right? And then as far as um, expenditures, it's the slide before that, slide number five, right? Uh, the general fund 2021-22 biennial budget, those represent some of the expenditures that could be reduced, right? It really would be the services that you're hearing about. That, okay. that okay. is what you'd be talking about reducing which is why we're spending quite a bit of time talking about the services because all those expenditures mm -hmm. support mm -hmm. the services. Okay, okay, got yeah, it. Yes, so it's the, I'll just simply share my screen so that everybody can see the particular slide. So um, yes, it would be these portions of the budget right here. And these are two year totals. These aren't one year totals. So you can almost cut each of these in half, and that would be the total for each year. Okay, and then Rick, one last question um, on the handouts. Actually, we'll use the ones that were on the tables. Okay, actually, would you mind pulling that up? I'm sorry, just one more time. Um, and somebody in one of the community members asked a question in the first Q&A about- Four hours. Baseline revenues, they're in the 50, 000, 50 million range, as long as the, as well as the expenditures are in the 50 million range. What are the sources of those? Um, because like revenues, baseline revenues, that's a little bit lower than the slide that we were just looking at. Um, general operating revenues at 86 million. So I'm just, I'm just curious, why this $30 million difference? The general operating revenues for 2021 to 2022 are actually uh, for the two year total about $86 million. That's about $43 million each, um, each year for 2021 and 2022. Back in 2020, we were all working from pandemic influenced uh, forecasts. And so since that time, we received much better information from our region's economists. And all of that has since been trued up to reflect less of an impact of the pandemic on our economy than what everybody had feared would happen back in the summer of 2020. So the numbers that you're seeing in the budget book are, were influenced by the fears the pandemic would, would ravage the economy, but that hasn't come to fruition for Shoreline. So we're back to a near, um, pre-pandemic state in terms of our economy. Okay, okay. Okay, thank you, Rick. Well, go ahead, Robin. Well, I, I am, um, I'm very, very interested in how we grow our revenue. And this goes back to uh, Nathan's presentation. Um, the, cost of construction, we got this, all this revenue, sales tax from the cost of construction, but once the construction's over, that goes away. And with the hundreds of apartment, apartments we are bringing to town and say one, one and a half people per apartment, we, we need to capture these people. We need to put a, you know, rope around shoreline and say, you got to buy your stuff in shoreline and we need more stuff to sell. 
and this perplexes me and it has perplexed me for years and I and I sound almost as though I'm harping but I don't mean to harp but I am really want to emphasize the need for us to grow our economy we need more stuff for people to buy we need to increase our retail tax tax revenue and we're never going to be Bellevue, we're never going to be Linwood, we're never going to have that level of retail tax income, but we certainly have the opportunity to have more places for people to spend money in our city limits and capture that tax revenue. And I'm, I'm more interested in the revenue side of this than the expenditure side because I having been on the library trustee, been a library trustee for a decade, I understand the rising cost of health care, these other things that are going up. And our revenue is almost kind of flat compared to the increase in expenditures, the things we are obliged to pay for. And I would be highly opposed to cutting back services, parks, police, anything that protects our citizens, anything that our citizens believe is what makes Shoreline Shoreline. And so I'm, I am perplexed about our um, inability, it feels like an inability to me, to bring more retail to town. And even some of the things that are proposed like Shoreline Place, that's a decade away, that's a long time off. And um, what we could do more, more immediately would be is of interest to me, how we, how we bring restaurants, stuff to buy, blah, 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 you know what I'm saying. But I think the revenue side is where I would like to have my focus. Yeah, I see a couple hands up, and I, I will go to Sarah and Rick just for a reminder, too. Of they're, 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 I think that's an excellent question, and it probably does need a lot of exploration, but it's still, I think, slightly away from this group's charge, yeah. um, which is not around um, increasing sales tax. Yeah, I think, Robin, that that, that, that is an excellent area of discussion, but probably outside of this purview. But certainly something I'll make sure to ask Nate that I don't know whether there's a another group that could um, you know engage in that where the, whether there's an opportunity for additional engagement. But I know it is the whole focus and council every year at our their economic or their annual strategic planning retreat. Those conversations happen without fail. They are constantly and so they're changing regulations like the first floor you know retail. Re in, and they're actually requiring that now in some areas um, in order to try and encourage that. But there's, a, it's, it's complicated. So um, anyway, but I do appreciate that. And I think it would be something you could comment on mm -hmm. in the final report, but I don't think we can focus too much of our discussion time on it. Yeah, but we can raise it. So appreciate that, Robin. Uh, John, I see your hand. If you could just take yourself off mute. Rick, could you go back to the spreadsheet one more time? And I'm sorry to keep raising this question. No what, need to apologize. No, what <laughs> revenue would you need an additional each year to make the gap zero. So the additional revenue. If the city had the option, and in some cases, depending on the different programs, it might be very possible um, to, in the first year in 2024, if we could raise $107,000 of revenue, and if it's ongoing, it means we get 107,000 this year and well, next year, then, we would be able to solve the gap for 2024. And we would solve that problem and be able to fund that service ongoing. Then in 2025, we'd need another $1.1 million of revenue just to be able to cover the growth and the year over year growth and expenditures. I, I'd still, if you 
removed the gap of the uh, balance of budget for 2024, and you've projected the revenues and expenditures for 2025, how does the 107 continue on to 2025? Because in this situation, we've only used one-time resources. If we covered this for one-time resources, in other words, if we took the, the revenues here and we use savings, then um, it's the way this formula works. But yeah, we would have resolved that gap, but still ongoing, ongoing revenues didn't increase. Ongoing revenues still stayed the same. We just used one-time savings in that year. So the gap still exists. Well, aren't the baseline revenues, your model predict, the revenues that you expect to receive that year? That's what we expect to receive that year, yes. And in 2025, you've 53, yes. So why does you why do you accumulate the 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 differences the gaps it seems you have a if you projected just the revenue the difference between the revenue and expenses for each year and you added those up that would be how much you'd have to spend by 2020 30 to remove all the gaps why does why does 107 continue on if you uh for 20, from say 2024, why does it continue through 2023 or 2030? Because the cost that resulted in this $107,000 in expenditures that exceed revenues, that service is still existing into the future. Right. To that, there's additional growth in expenditures and that growth and additional growth in expenditures happens each year. That's, that's what we're trying to illustrate and I was trying to break down here, that by the time you get out to 2030 and you have revenues of 58.2 million and you have expenditures of 65.7 million, so you have a shortfall in 2030 of 7.4 million, that shortfall is made up of shortfalls that started in 2024 and grew in 2025, 2026, all the way through 2030 to the short, the total shortfall from revenues and expenditures. That's why they continue to exist because they're, they haven't been resolved either with new revenue or reduced expenditures. One other so, way to so think time, about it. So they, they, can I just try and say it one other way? Maybe that would be helpful. I, or maybe not, but let me, <laughs> cause sometimes just hearing things a different way. Um, if you filled the bucket in, let's say, year 2024 with one time and 2025 in one time, at the end of 2026, you're going to now have to cut. Now you say, now we're going to really solve the problem. You're going to have to cut not just the $1.2 million for 2026. You're going to have to cut a total of ongoing reductions of $2.5 million, $2,493 million because you didn't solve the problem. So that, that's how it keeps getting, you know, if you're doing temporary fixes, you're just kicking the can down the road and now you have to solve the real problem that's just getting bigger every year. What's the total amount this committee is, should be looking at to, for raising revenues, for example, to remove this problem? Well, we will be that that's what we will be diving into in week three week four um in in but it's that for the whole life of the thing it's you know 25.952 million right so it's 30 million dollars is the total revenue that needs to be increased over the period of the forecast that's right uh, lincoln has a hand up go ahead yeah so I'm going to take sort of a contrary view in that I think if anything you've underestimated what your gaps might be and I'll, I'll, <laughs> let me just give you this again having listened to the earlier part of the presentations about permitting population growth expectations. You know, there are certain functions which are uh, just a function of how much activity so permitting 
you'll have to add clerks and others if the permitting level that you've recently experienced continues. You can't tell people to wait a year to get you know, a design review and other things done if you expect to capture you know, if you, your share of the population growth. Same thing with your, your police. I think you know, if you're rapidly growing your population, which with the number of new units coming on, would suggest to me to make that one you know, officer per thousand ratio, you're gonna to have to hire two or three new people in the next few years. So that being said, I think if anything, the case for why to do a levy lift, you know, if anything should be predicated, not just on the straight, here's our revenue as we projected it, but rarely on some of these other factors that you've talked about in terms of the growth of the city and the growth and maintaining levels of service that people expect. And, you know, Rick, the one thing I would say also coming with you know, increased demand as population grows, there is a certain correlation with you know, retail sales, even if your retail sales could be, you know, at a straight ratio, if you add 4,000 more people, there's a certain amount of additional revenue. Your revenue forecast is pretty mild in terms of its rate of increase, but I, I guess I just go back down to the task as I see it for this committee is to evaluate, do we believe that there's a need? And if there is, do we have the documents to be able to sell to the population that's gonna vote? You know, why this need is there and what, if this is an adequate, measure to cover that gap. And so I would just, that's my only observations is I think we need to, in the written documents that you use coming out of this process, talk about the fact that you've got unusual levels of growth in permitting, city, you know, demand for services that will stretch, you know, the ability of a small suburb to keep up. And Lincoln, those are very good points. And I'll just say that we are working as part for our future conversations on some scenarios that show some of that anticipated growth that departments have been estimating what even their current unmet need is, right? And then much less what it's looking like coming down the pike. So we will have some of those scenarios that we'll be able to discuss with you at the, at the future meetings. All right, any other questions for Rick or Sarah? Thank you. Time to sign off. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're almost at nine, um, but I appreciate everyone's questions and um, especially thanks to Rick and Sarah and uh, Christy and Sharon for staying on the line um, and really appreciate everyone's engagement. Um, and Robin, we will figure out how to get you materials ahead of time. Um, but uh, yeah, until next meeting, I guess two weeks from now, we'll see everyone again. Thank you very much. Good night. Bye-bye. Thank you Bye. all. Thank you.